My name is Jonas Singer. Thanks for having me. I think design is all about constraints and just being told to talk about food doesn't put many on there. So, um, you know, I hemmed and hawed through a lot and I put Joel through the ringer stressing out whether I would actually get this done or not. So thanks Joel for bearing with me over this. Um, anyways, I am the owner of uh, Blind Dog Cafe, Tubi Studios and Union Kitchen. And I, you know, as I mentioned, I thought about a lot of different things I could discuss with you this morning. And after exploring many ideas, I decided that the best thing for me to do would really just to be talk about our story and what we do and the things that we've gone through in sort of building our, our businesses. Um, and really about how we use food as a means of supporting ourselves, as the core focus of our business operations, as a means of creative expression, and as a means of really bringing together community, but in a more fundamental way of using food and the culture it promotes uh, as a way of changing the user experience of us as citizens and consumers. So this is the building, I apologize, some of the formatting and stuff got screwed up in the presentation, but we'll deal with it. So this is the building in which we have Blind Dog Cafe at Darnell's. Uh, Blind Dog was the first business that uh, I opened with my business partner, Colin Gilchrist, and also with Noah Karish. And you know, one of the foundational lessons we learned here at Blind Dog is that uh, design is all about constraints. And so here you see our counter space. For those of you who've been to the cafe, it's, it's a pretty small space. There's not a ton of room. And so this is the basic setup uh, of the counter that customers see when they come into Blind Dog. And what we've really gone for is to make everything functional and usable and as efficient as possible, while also being appealing, colorful, and engaging. And you know, basically, we want things to work, to be cheap, but also to be whimsical. And this is something we've really strived for across all of the businesses that we have. And so this is Tubi Studios, and you see the inside of what it looks like in one of the artist space. And Tubi is an interesting warehouse space, um, and we've used a lot of movable walls on the inside, so it's intended really to be both a functional space to create art, um, but also to display work and to host guests. Um, we opened up Tubi last fall, and there are six working artists in there now. And so I would imagine that the reason I'm here today is because of Union Kitchen. And Union Kitchen is a food incubator where there are about 40 different businesses operating out of this warehouse space. And so the core mission of Union Kitchen is really to provide our members both the opportunity to produce their food, to practice their craft, but also to help them sell and distribute it. And as such, everything we do there on so many levels is all about design and user experience, from optimizing the layout of the kitchen, kitchen for efficiency, to making sure that things look and feel nice and clean, to making the space always welcome intriguing, and intriguing for guests so that the physical space itself can become our brand, build our brand, and help build the businesses that use our space. So our story starts here, um, LaJoy Park. I live just inside of there. And so a couple years back, I was in the uh, final months of my stint as the executive director of a nonprofit foundation. And it was the summer, and for whatever reason, I decided that I should adopt a dog. I don't know why. I was having pangs of guilt over my whatever. And so I adopted a dog named Baxter. And you know, soon after, I found myself walking around the neighborhood with this blind dog, bumping into things and crashing his head. And so me and Cullen would wander around. I became friends with Cullen because he and my younger brother were buddies. And Cullen at the time was working as a line cook. And we would walk around and talk about how much the neighborhood was changing. Um, you know, despite this beautiful picture sort of moving in, if you kept walking that direction, you know, the neighborhood was not nearly as pretty and there was just a lot of change going on. And at the time, there were lots of new folks coming in, but there weren't a lot of new businesses coming in. And the businesses that were there just, they weren't quite hitting the mark. They weren't necessarily appealing to the folks who were coming in. They weren't going that extra level of having a design and aesthetic that was welcoming and open to the community. And so we would talk about opening up a market or a cafe, something that would be simple, that would appeal to people. It would make us a little bit of money. It would be beautiful and accessible. And of course, it would also be cheap for us to open. And no cheap. You know, cheap is the hardest thing to find. And so uh, how are we going to do this? Well, luckily, we found Darnell. Now, I have no food experience. And while in retrospect, I probably always had an entrepreneurial spirit, I certainly had no intention at the time of opening my own business, let alone going into the insanity of the food business. But on a lark, we thought we would approach Darnell. Uh, Noah and I had been friends with Darnell and regulars at his bar for a couple years. And he had mentioned to us he had always wanted to have a coffee cafe in the, in the space and everything. 
And hell, you know, it couldn't hurt to ask. By this time, I was unemployed, I had lost my job, and I had nothing better to do than go bother Darnell to see if he'd let us open a coffee shop inside of his space. And so this was back in December of 2011, right around the time the Howard Theater was being reconstructed. And all around us in Shaw and LaDroit Park and U Street, there was this sense of revitalization. It wasn't quite bursting yet, but it was fomenting. You could feel the change. You know, you knew it was happening, but the, the sort of finished product wasn't quite yet that, there yet. And so we felt that this was a great time for us. It was a great time in our lives, but also in the life of the city. As everything was getting a new coat of paint and polish, and as races and generations were being crashed into each other, uh, and as the cost of rent skyrocketed, it seemed like a great time for us to just throw some shit up against the wall and see what worked. Because that's what people were looking for, especially when it came to food, and when it came to cafes and restaurants, and the places that we spend our time and our money and meet other people, you know, all of this change was happening and there was just the opportunity to do things that were new and unique and that people wouldn't be totally astonished by, but that would embrace and would try it out. And so, for whatever reason, and probably much to his great regret, Darnell said yes. He was like, sure, you guys can come in and open the cafe. And we did it quickly. For about six weeks, we pushed very hard to open. And, and I have to tell you, I never thought that we would actually open. I don't mean to say I didn't think we could do it. It's just that at the time, we never, I didn't really take it seriously. I just thought this was all fun and games and that at some point there'd be a reason not to do it and I would just go get another job. Um, you know, there'd be a major barrier, there'd be some huge expense, the bottom would fall out, whatever, and we'd have to stop. But it never happened and six weeks later, in February, we were open and like with the Howard Theater, there was a definite sense of before and after. We changed a lot about the interior, from the paint to the appearance of the walls, art, and a lot of other things the customer doesn't see, but that ends up showing up in the aesthetic and the functionality of the space. And of course, this before and after led to a you know, broadening of the demographic we were reaching out to, the people who showed up, and the number of customers that just walked in the door every day. And so at this point, you know, we had just opened a business, and over the last couple years, we've really started to learn about what makes a food business tick. How are you successful, and what are the broader themes? And you know, first and most importantly, you have to have good product. Good food, good coffee, like the vigilante guys have, good drinks, whatever it is you do, do it well and do it beautifully. You know, food is really interesting because we all eat with our eyes before we, we actually eat the food and no two food experiences are totally alike. And so you have to make good food, you have to make it simple and accessible, make it reliable, but above all it has to be appealing and whatever that sort of vague sense of appealing is. And so like with all things, you know, food is not alone in a vacuum, especially in a cafe where food is even more experiential than in many other environments. Food in a cafe setting serves really as a force for gathering and human connection, and so the space too must be conducive to that. And so the space, like the food, has to be open and accessible and hearty, encouraging those human connections. And as we think about the intersection of space and food, we get the heart of one of our primary design focuses, which is that form and function must be closely aligned. Even the headband is for food safety reasons. Um, and this goes back to you know, two of our core thoughts, which is really that we're always focusing on the user experience. A cafe especially is just all about the user experience. We talk a lot about the difference between service and hospitality. For those of you who've been to the cafe, I'm sure we've screwed up your order. We're probably slow sometimes, but I bet we've been nice and smiled and flirted with you a little bit. Um, and we've also always wanted to be cheap. We just don't have that much money and we're living in a very expensive city. And to be successful, you just gotta be close with your money. And we never had that much of it, and so we wanted to make things attractive but also sensible. And we wanted to be efficient. And so the design always had to promote the product. The design had to promote the food because the meal is the reason why we exist. And so everything in the cafe space has to support that product. And so especially in a place like ours, you know, that almost has that speakeasy feel, supporting the product really means guiding the user experience. It means optimizing the products you give them. Eating food, looking at art, enjoying music, using a website, all of these things are totally dynamic experiences. And our cafe, which doesn't have a ton of signage, doesn't have a ton of branding on the outside, you wouldn't necessarily know it's there, is a really hearty example of needing to train customers so that the food can really shine through. And so, you know, confused people who aren't sure where they are or what they're ordering or who they're talking to, they need some guidance. We need to train our customers. And so a lot of our focus at the cafe, if you've been there, is really on trying to guide that user experience to allow the food and the product to flourish. And along the same lines, we've learned about the, just the vital importance of packaging. Um, you know, it really, again, sets that stage for user experience, for the sense of someone understanding what they're about to get, what they're about to taste, uh, the type of business that they're interacting with when they try a product. And what's so interesting to me about packaging is how much it conveys about the specific product, the literal thing they're holding, 
but as well about the whole line of products, about the, uh, the, the larger company. I read, I read a quote a couple of days ago, it was Andy Warhol, and uh, Food and Wine magazine had asked him what was the best meal he ever had. And he said the best meal he ever had was a Big Mac in Tokyo, because it tasted the exact same as a Big Mac in Manhattan. You know, and I just think that's a fascinating idea that all of these things are setting the stage for what our taste buds actually taste, but that so much of it is defined by the design that surrounds it. And similarly, you know, when you accompany it with good branding, uh, good packaging can go a really, really long way to making a good product great, to making a decent company successful. And so, you know, at our outset, and what I've been talking about so far, we were very, very much focused on the design of the food and promoting the quality of the meal. And this is something that Cullen and I were both very focused on and that Cullen, as, as the food expert in our business, really excels at. But a core part of the cafe is just that ambiance. It's that hard to define just environment that you're in. And this is something that for, for Cullen, who is a back of the house cook and not focused on front of the house, or for me, never really having been in this field, you know, it took a long time for us to really fully understand what it was about the environment that was defining that user experience. Um, and the cafe is about that. It's about people hanging out and connecting. And so m linking up with Darnell was just a huge blessing for us because his thing was that he always wanted his space to feel like your living room. And for a cafe, that's so perfect because you can carve out that laid back, casual, but fun and airy and intimate feel. And it's a place where strangers interact because their guards are down and it feels cozy and different and hidden away. And I think, you know, the fact that Blind Dog is a little hidden away and different is great because it creates something different and it creates something weird. So for those of you who've been there on a Monday, uh, these two guys who are two of our employees decided to come up with uh, Country Western Mondays. And they had their whole lingo and they would listen to country music all day and you would, if you ordered based on the, the, the sort of dictionary they made up for it, we'd give you free coffee and stuff. And it's that sense of, you know, being hidden away that, that I love most about Blind Dog. And I think it's the thing that we want to do more of. And it's that sense of being somewhere, you know, you feel almost secret or hidden away. We heard that a lot when we opened, that people were like, oh, I'm, you know, I love this place, but I'm not going to tell anyone so it doesn't get too crowded. And I think it's that sense of being somewhere different and secret and hidden that gives that sense of indulgence. And that sense of indulgence is transferred for the, to the food. And so for us, a lot of it was trying to encapsulate all of this and make sure, again, that that user experience that we had carved out that was unique and different could really be, you know, magnified when people came into the space. And so I know I love that sense of awe and wonder and sometimes confusion that I see in customers when they walk through the door. And so it's the combination of the exterior of our building, of our signage, of the uh, immediate design when you walk into the cafe, the people you meet, and then of course the food itself that I think makes Blind Dog really an experience. And it's something we strive to make our other businesses like. Now I'll also say a lot of this is not of our own doing. A lot of this is just pure serendipity that we've stumbled upon, but that we look back on and say, how do we learn from this Thing that's been so successful for us without really us even being all that intentional and trying to glean from that experience what we can use moving forward to improve our businesses. And fundamentally what we think is that it comes down to that user experience, that somehow the combination of elements here has created a user experience that, that we like, that we're fond of, and that other people seem to like. And it's a user experience that seems to be getting a little bit rarer in the world. And I guess the sort of dichotomy, you know, the, the competing dichotomy here is that Customer service and user experience has become more primary in business everywhere. Um, it is the thing that is most emphasized across every company. But it's also become more and more standardized. And it's that standardization of user experience that concerns us and is that, that's what we're focused on as, as I sort of get into the rest of this talk about Union Kitchen. And you know, what we've observed is that often customer experience has become standardized because People are so risk averse, like if we do something different, it might cost us money, so we're not gonna do it. So we're gonna make every customer experience like a Chipotle or like calling Verizon on the phone or whatever it is. And we see the same models everywhere. But what this has done is it's led to a constricting of those experiences we have. It's led to a constricting of culture. So we'd been at Blind Dog for you know, a few months and it was going pretty well. And you know, all of a sudden, some developers, of course, walked in the door and started making us offers and giving us opportunities to open a new space. And it's this space right here, this tiny little building right there, which is like an all glass hut. It's a cool little space. And so we had to start learning about a lot of things. You know, we got this offer on the table and we had started the business just for fun as a lark. And the fun was kind of over now. Like this was the real deal. This was like making real decisions about what you're doing with your life and your money and those sorts of things. And so we had to learn a lot about all sorts of things, leases and build outs and negotiating and payroll and management and, you know, transporting food around and kitchen equipment and, and all these things that we had no freaking clue about that suddenly were thrust into and we're about to spend all our life savings on. And most importantly, we had to learn about like what is it that we really wanted? 
in all honesty, we opened up the cafe because we had no idea what we really wanted. And this was a great way of spending our time doing something we could really be focused on without having a larger sense of what we were doing with the rest of our lives. And now suddenly, that question was coming back full circle to say, what is it that you want to do with the rest of your lives? Is this it? And so what we were really being offered, we realized, was the opportunity for money and for scalability. It wasn't the opportunity to scale our quirkiness or our whimsy or the things that we liked, but it was the opportunity to scale up our finances. Uh, it was the opportunity to tighten our constraints, but in a way that was limiting, not necessarily would help us to flourish because it focused us. And now, you know, I want to convey, we're business people. There's nothing wrong with making money. I want to make lots and lots of money. But as funny as it sounds, that's not why we had started Blind Dog. We had started Blind Dog because we wanted to be active in creating the city that we wanted to live in. I didn't want to be a bystander in my culture or in my life or in the choices of what I had to do with my time. But we wanted to be participants in that or maybe even leaders in that process. And so we realized then through this process of talking with these developers that there are a lot of ways to make money. But there are only so many chances to really find a channel for creativity that will also pay the bills. And so we started searching for those unique chances. We started searching for a canvas, you know, searching for a space to create. And so after searching and searching and getting pickier and pickier, we found a couple opportunities. The first came with 2B Studios, where we found cheap warehouse space, knocked down a few walls, tore up some carpet. I would imagine that the Include guys did the same thing looking at their floors here. So you, some of you may know the process there. Um, and what that allowed us to do was to carve out some space for artists. And they could bring what they love and their creativity and their ingenuity into the world. And at about the same time we were doing that, we were finalizing a lease for Union Kitchen. Um, this is the building that Union Kitchen is in. And at the time, all we really knew about what we were doing in, with this business, we knew it would be about food. But really, all we knew was that it was on an awesome street in a really unique location in a different setting that most of us think of being in downtown DC. Our little block, which is all manufacturing, is only about maybe a mile and a half from here. It's right in Noma. And it's just not a place you find much in the city anymore. And so similarly to like what we had experienced at Blind Dog, we felt this just transformative element there. We felt that there was something hidden and something different and something that you seek out in a world of standardization. So let me tell you a little bit more about Union Kitchen and how it works. So Union Kitchen is a licensed commercial kitchen and food incubator. Uh, and the way it works is really quite simple. We have a big warehouse, as you've seen, with a big kitchen and all of the equipment necessary to run a food operation. We have about uh, 35 businesses operating out of the space now. And the goal is, as stated here, to create low risk, low cost opportunities for businesses to test, launch, grow, and sustain. In a more general sense, though, the goal really is to promote culture by facilitating people to create food. We believe that community gathers around food and that to truly have a local organic culture that we can be proud of, we have to have local small food businesses driving that culture forward. Local small food businesses that are pushing the envelope of what our user experience is from the design, the food, just the customer service perspective. And to do so, they need cheap space, they need technical assistance, and they need every opportunity to put their own spin on that user exp uh, experience out into the world. And so to sort of drill down into it, for us, opportunity is really pointed at the chance. The chance to have space, the chance to sell. Simply by having the opportunity, like we stumbled into at Blind Dog, is such a hard thing to come by. We feel like we were able to create an imprint on our neighborhood with Blind Dog simply because someone gave us the opportunity to do so. And so we want to do the same. Access is really about the, the ability to capitalize on that opportunity. You know, to be successful in the food business, you need to be a master cook, a logistician, a manager, a janitor, a real estate agent, a lawyer, an accountant, a bookkeeper, an architect, a landscape designer, all of these things. And I'm sure that's true in a lot of businesses as well. And it's just so hard to understand where to start in these areas, let alone to flourish. People don't have the access to the vocabulary or the basic understanding in these fields. And so without access to, these, to that information or to that expertise, they can't bring their food, their product, their aesthetic, their design, their own, tank on you, their own take on user experience into the world. And so without access, we end up with less and less diversity, with less and less culture. And so the idea is building the opportunity for people to put their own spin on things. And so for us, what this is all about is the intersection of food, business, and design as a way of promoting varying user experiences. In a word, to promote culture. The same thing that designers are doing, web designers are doing, entrepreneurs are doing everywhere. It's, it's that notion of promoting culture through diversity. You know, there's an old Sly Stallone movie, I can never remember if it's Judge Dredd or Demolition Day, but the only restaurant left is Taco Bell, right? 
And it's funny, but like so much of what we do is framed through the prism of that notion of like all that's going to be left is Taco Bell and Walmart, you know? And we don't want to have Taco Bells everywhere. We're already getting Walmarts in DC, right? So, you know, we want to see the amazing people around us have the chance to, uh, you know, put into the universe what they, th what they think is interesting, what they think is beautiful. And so at Union Kitchen, our focus is really on empowering that opportunity because it creates these diverse user experiences. And so alone, you know, the benefits of Union Kitchen are straightforward. They're lengthy. Uh, you'll see a list running here of all the things a business owner worries about when they're out on their own. And so our goal is really to lower barriers to entry through lowering costs in terms of time, money, hassle, expertise, so on and so forth. And you know, moreover though, consider having to worry about form and function or your food or the design of your store when you're also worrying about your pest control contract or your payroll or fixing the leak in your three-pot sink. You know, design suffers at the hands of business. User experience suffers at the hands of reality. And so at Union Kitchen, the members just pay a flat membership fee for each month, and then they just cook their food, manage their businesses, and Colin and I deal with everything else. And so in the big picture, all of this doing that we do frees them up to create culture. Literally, we've created all this free space on this slide that's going to be filled in by something other than the bullshit that was up there before. And what replaces it, I'll show you, the next few slides are some of the different brands and food businesses we have operating of our space. But what fills this void, what people do with their time when they're not bogged down is beautiful and it's amazing and it's, it's what we want to spend our time looking at. So here you see a couple bottles for, uh, made by Capital Kombucha uh, for the Cherry Blossom Festival this year. Um, Capital Kombucha operates out of our space, it's a fermented tea drink. This is Thunder Pig Confectionery run by uh, Meg Murray, she run, won the Startup Kitchen. Um, she calls her husband Thunderpig for whatever reason, it's her pet name, and so <laughs> that is where this bizarre logo has come from. I don't ask questions, I just put the slides together. This is frosting, this is gluten-free vegan frosting being made um, in really cool, interesting packaging. This is the sort of top-down shot of it, which I just think is a really awesome screenshot there. This is the catering card for a startup ice cream company called Ice Cream Jubilee. Her day job is being a lawyer for the Defense Department. <laughs> Here in DC, this guy, this guy left his day job. He is a, running a butchery and charcuterie company. Milk Colt. <laughs> uh, so these are two guys who are all about the design and aesthetic. They're driving around this summer on a motorcycle with a freezer sidecar, and they're selling ice cream sandwiches and cold brew off their motorcycle. <laughs> uh, Los Vericos is a uh, uh, catering company that focuses on pork products. Uh, and just this, you know, different design aesthetic. And then this is uh, some photography of DC Patisserie, which is run by a woman named Alex DeBianchi, and uh, she specializes in macaroons. And so we can see from all of these that, you know, food is beautiful and it's also commerce, but that all of these things, when you look at them, are really priming you for a different kind of user experience. It's telling you something about the creator, about the brand. It's something, you know, someone putting themselves into the world through the design that they put on their food. So in addition to all these food companies, we also have uh, a couple artistic companies in our space. One is uh, Lauren Friedman, who runs My Closet and Sketches. Um, she has a blog where she does all hand-drawn and, and blogs. Um, some of you may know her. And then we also have Cherry Blossom Creatives, run by Tori Partridge. And so Cherry Blossom Creatives did all of the designs that you saw there, all the food product designs. They're, she, they're the ones who put together that actual packaging in coordination with the, uh, the, the customer, the, the producers of the food. And so, as a part of our community, we invested in having artists in our space. We understood the importance of having artistic, design-oriented people working with us, helping us with our physical space, but also serving as a resource for the different businesses and members that we have. You know, again, food is all about the design on so many levels. And while the people making the food can do beautiful favors, they can make it aesthetically pleasing, we understood how critical a broader sense of design in the food world is to success. And so the end goal of all this is to create a community of people who want to bring their creativity, their spin on user experience into the world. This diversity of tastes, ranging from taste in food to taste in space, colors, functions, it's what promotes diverse culture. And so starting with the simplicity of food can truly lead to a broadening of our cultural experience. And so to achieve this then, we at Union Kitchen emphasize collective action by design. We view collective action as the positive, dynamic outgrowth of community. By bringing people together and building basic competencies, individuals develop the skills and capacity to actually push out into the world. Putting something, to, something into the world and making it stick is really so difficult. 
You know, making food really is the easy part, but getting people to eat it, to understand it, to know your story from the meal that they're sharing with you is a wonderful challenge, and it's truly a challenge. And it's a challenge worth undertaking because it's what leads to a city by the people and for the people. It's your neighbors and your friends and you creating the city around you. So much of your city for so long has been dictated by things outside of the force of the people actually using it, the people actually in this room. And so, you know, I want a city that reflects me. It reflects who I am. It's what I want. I want a city that is authentic to me. And that starts and ends with food. It starts and ends with the people around us being in charge of the user experience, of the people around us being the ones dictating what their restaurant is like, their customer service is like, what their design is like. And really what the amazing thing is, is that all of this is happening. DC has become such an entrepreneurial place. And, and I'd like to think that we have played somewhat of a role in that. And while we are all still figuring out what the hell is going on and where the city is going and what the character of our town will be in a few years, the people around us are actually opening these businesses. People are embracing not only the opportunity to be their own bosses and to make their own money, but they're truly embracing the notion of putting their own design, spin, and user experience into the world. And so importantly, that ownership is ownership in community and in culture. It's ownership over that culture of food and what we put out into the world. And so we hope that in our own little way, our work at Blind Dog, Tubi Studios, and Union Kitchen has helped to push this forward, helps to create the city that we want to live in. So that's all I got. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having me.